Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 53 of Ask the CEO with Avraham Gatail. Today is a real special episode. We have a special guest today. He's a cool hunter who increases global brands revenue and market share by using technology to develop stronger emotional connections between businesses and their customers. He's a top influencer on the Internet of Things and the fourth most followed CMO on Twitter. He's the chief marketing officer for Singapore-based intelligent IoT messaging company Unified Inbox. He's a popular author and frequent speaker on leveraging technology for marketing. Listen to him share the latest social business news, trends, tools, and best practices every week on the Social Solutions Show, broadcasted on Modern Life Network in the U.S. and on Channel Radio in the U.K. A man so great, we had to bring him on twice. It is my pleasure to welcome the one and only Ken Heron. Welcome, Ken. Oh, thank you. I think my mom wrote that introduction for you. I am convinced. Only she <laughs> would say things like that. <laughs> we'll have to get that over to her. Mm-hmm. She'll put it on the fridge, guaranteed. She'll put it on her smart fridge, which will text her. Uh, not quite for my mom, but we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> Awesome. So Ken, last time we brought you on, we focused on the amazing ways you work with business leaders to help them leverage the power of IoT technology in order to accelerate their revenue growth and to make the world a much better place. And for our listeners out there, you can check that out on episode 32. It's a value packed episode. Um, let's spend a few minutes just getting an update on the latest trends and greatest accomplishments in the world of IoT. Then we'll move on and talk about your social solutions show, as I know there's a lot of interest on that topic. We're really seeing an acceleration. Just a very short time ago, if we look at this time last year, people were talking about the Internet of Things or IoT. Now, the conversation has changed. It's not a question of if, it's a question of how. Mm. And I would suggest that the Internet of Things can be better understood by saying it's really about communication. How do you communicate with these new smart devices, connected products, and how do they communicate back with you in the way that makes the most sense? We're not just talking about products for the home, your Nest thermostat, your Amazon Echo, but we're also talking about business and industrial products. For example, I had a meeting earlier this morning over in Saudi Arabia. They're using smart cameras, not just for security, which would be how we traditionally think of a camera, but really being able to monitor and track business processes with an extremely high degree of precision so that you know what's happening on your production line as it happens. So if anything is off or not up to spec, it is caught immediately, and that reduces costs and prevents problems later on throughout the production cycle. Yeah, for sure, because if anything goes wrong with a production line, that can be a very costly problem. And you would never think about using something like a security camera to help them manage their, their production line. And it really can. The cameras can see things that we can't and can analyze them much more quickly. So let's say you're, silly example, you're stirring a pot of something or a robot is stirring a pot of something and go. the temperature is supposed to be within a very narrow parameter. Well, if it's off by a tenth of a degree, uh, a human may not be able to see that. Even a robot's temperature sensor may not be able to pick up that start of an increase. But when you have a camera who's using infrared or other spectrum to be able to notice these things, you can deal with them in a very real sense. This is especially important in environments that are extreme. Uh, often there are desert environment and we know the world is heating up, but there are environments where temperature, humidity, I live here in Florida, so we, we live and die by the humidity. <laughs> it's yeah. a big issue. Uh, also certain businesses have raw ingredients or raw materials that are vary from batch to batch. Uh, you're a fish processing plant. Uh, depending on how much bacteria are in the fish, that determines how fresh it actually is. So it's fascinating to me that these cameras, because they can see things we can't, because they can respond immediately, not when something gets to an unsafe level or to a level that there's a problem, but when it starts to increase, when things start to go off, that oftentimes 
the business impacting problem can be identified so much earlier on in the process and not just save the price of the camera, but can really see that return on investment in a very rapid time frame. For sure, because when the problem starts, it's still small enough that it hasn't impacted anything yet. And it can often be corrected. Yeah. Uh, we're even seeing it in healthcare that if a, a patient is being monitored after surgery and there's always a fear of infection, well, if you can catch it early enough, you can change the direction of that outcome before it starts to negatively impact the patient. So that's amazing. It's, it's, it's almost as if the technology is giving us superpowers and the artificial intelligence is allowing us to understand it, to put it in a way that we can then take action on it. Because you, you've heard the terms Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, they're really two sides of the same coin. It's fair to say that the Internet of Things would not be accelerating near as quickly if it was not for artificial intelligence, that it helps us to manage the capabilities that the IoT gives us. There you go. And that was the key word there, to manage the capabilities, because just having a smart device with no brains behind it doesn't really give you much. <laughs> You're not getting the full impact out of what it can do. Uh, and we'll use the, the thermostat as a good example. If it knows when I'm home and knows when I'm not, if it can learn my patterns, it can anticipate. Uh, very simple example here in Florida, hot most of the year, not all of the year. Well, <laughs> I don't want to waste money on the electricity, on the energy. The costs are quite high, but it takes time. It's not like flipping a switch and suddenly the place is cool. Well, if the thermostat knows how long it takes to reach the desired temperature based on that given stays, temperature and humidity and number of people in the room, it can make smart adjustments much better than I can by yanking the thermostat up and down that ends up wasting energy because, oh, it's hot, I'll turn it way down. Well, that's not exactly the most efficient way to do it. It can make smarter decisions than I can myself, which yeah. maybe isn't surprising to anyone, <laughs> but that's where you get these real impacts, especially at scale from either a business perspective or even a city perspective. Because some of the most exciting advances we're seeing are happening with cities that have huge amounts of resources, huge amounts of people to care for, they're implementing IoT and AI technologies and seeing some pretty dramatic benefits. Air pollution, traffic congestion, uh, water quality, things that really impact people's quality of lives. So it'll be interesting to see how this technology progresses because in just one year we've made such great strides and the world is such a better place because of that. We're seeing uh, both in developing economies, uh, things such as bringing fuel to places that didn't previously have the capability for a petrol station or a gas station, as well as in very sophisticated uh, economies like Dubai and Singapore that are arguably leading the rest of us, you know, flying taxis and all the rest, leading the rest of us into the future. That is truly fascinating and also a great segue into the next part of our conversation because our whole discussion has really been about how we engage with people emotionally, right? It's not about the technology, about the specifics of smart technology and what it can do, but how does it affect our lives? So with regards to things like marketing, right? Um, that's that's another thing that affects our lives because everywhere we go, right, we see brands uh, shouting their marketing message at us to the point where we just become indifferent to it. Mm -hmm. And every business needs to market, otherwise it just goes out of business. So marketing is a very important part of business. And as, the, as technology progresses, we have um, different different modes or different venues for marketing, right? So in the olden days, we, uh, we had Apple carts, for example, and we had mm -hmm. marketplaces, right? And then it, it uh, progressed where we had newspapers and then we had radio and TV, and now we have the web and social media, and then it's gonna become augmented reality and virtual reality, right? So everything's changing. 
But you know what I believe? I believe that while the venue is changing, the actual principles aren't going to change. The actual principles that carried us throughout the generation will remain the same. Let's take our Apple cart vendor, right? Who's in a marketplace and you have this marketplace back in the 1800s where they're selling a whole bunch of things, right? You have apples and pears and other fruits, and then you have people selling pots and pans, and then you have people selling rugs. So everybody's screaming, apples, apples, come and get your fresh apples, right? Because that's your marketing. That's how you let people know that you've got apples, but then you also have your presentation. You got to shine the apples, put the rotten ones on bottom, the fresh ones on top. <laughs> so that you sold a lot of apples, I can tell. <laughs> right, you show your best wares first, so that mm -hmm. the people are attracted to your uh, to your goods. That's your clickbait, right? No different today than pinning a tweet. Yes, <laughs> exactly. So here's the challenge, right? You've got six Apple vendors and everybody's shouting the same thing. Apples, apples, come get your fresh apples. So if you were an Apple vendor, how would you differentiate yourself so that people buy your apples? How about if instead of shouting the same thing that everybody else is shouting, why don't you appeal to people's interests? So for example, you can say, did you know that an apple a day keeps the doctor away? It's a great source of health. It's a source of boron, which uh, promotes uh, muscle growth and strong bones. And it's a great source of fiber. And if you would like that source of health, come and get one right here. Now that sounds a whole lot better than come get your fresh apples. So that's like marketing 102. However, what if people just don't care about health? right? You got people that love their potato chips and they love their fast food and hey, healthy food is great, but I just don't care, right? In that case, you're no better off. In fact, you may as well just join the chorus and shout uh, apples, apples, come get your fresh apples. So sometimes while you may have a good message, if it's not the right message to the right audience, that's not going to work. So let's take it one step further to sales 103, which is how about if you become fascinating? So there is an author, which I, I just love this book. Um, there's an author, Sally Hogshead, who wrote this book, Fascinate. It's a really fascinating book. And so it's all about uh, marketing and branding and how you could set yourself apart from the rest by being fascinating. And I believe she mentions uh, fascinate. The origin of that word um, is has something to do like with witchcraft, uh, <laughs> which is really okay. now. I which mean, is very I, accurate. Marketing has a lot of witchcraft in it. <laughs> exactly right. You're in or maybe enchanting, right? I'm, I may not be saying it correctly, but something to that effect. So, what if you? Every, you every day at 12 o'clock while people are on their lunch break, so they're out of their offices and in the marketplace, you started to tell a story and you weaved an enchanting tale about some princess eating this enchanting apple, which gives her magical powers. And she does all sorts of wonderful things and she's a heroine and saves the world, right? And then you leave every story off with a cliffhanger and say, you want to hear the rest, come back tomorrow. And oh, by the way, if you want to sample some of those magical powers right over there, by stand number four are these delicious looking apples, right? How, you, how do you think your sales will be affected? I think they're going to yeah. skyrocket. <laughs> they're going to skyrocket. Not only that, but all the competing apple vendors who can't tell a story to save their lives, they're going to pay you royalty because you're going to run out of apples in five minutes. And you're going to mm -hmm. end up selling their apples. So before you know it, they're going to be eating out of the palm of your hand. So, you know, the point I'm trying to make is that you can, you can take, I was going to say you can take lemons and make lemonade out of it, or you can take apples and make apple juice out of it. In a crowded world, you have the power to stand out and do your own thing and actually become successful. So that's my long-winded way of conveying how the emotional and social engagement is not really going to change in the digital marketplace. 
just the way you do it will change. What do you think about that? I think of the challenge for marketers has always been emotional human engagement at scale. What has changed is we now have a better understanding to figure out who our customers are in a level of detail. We have tools to be able to reach our customers and segment our customers in ways that were inconceivable just two years ago. And of course, we have tools to be able to create and tell our stories that used to be, uh, think, five years ago, I would need to quote, hire a professional, a specialist, to say, okay, I want to sell apples. I would need the story writer, I would need the storyteller, the producer, I would then have to rent space to be able, you know, there were all these complications that I couldn't just, I had less ability to speak for myself in an authentic voice, and certainly less ability to get my message out in a very broad mass market sense. Now it feels that the system is really rewarding the merit, really rewarding the authentic down to the very local person that all of us have a potentially equal voice. So if we are telling the best story, if we're telling an authentic story, we can be heard and this idea of going viral. No one spoke of going viral five, 10 years ago. It didn't exist. Now we can all do it, that we have the tools and it starts with who is your market? How can you connect with that market? And then how can you create the most relevant and appropriate stories to be able to to sell to that market. Uh, I would suggest that you will always have a portion of Apple buyers who are interested in health. Well, now you can tell those health-related stories and target them as well as the mass market. Hey, I'm all for the, the princess eating the apple story and having magical powers. You now have the ability to visualize that, whether it's in a GIF or a video or something else. The ability for all of us as individual business people, uh, whether we work for a small business or a large business, the ability for us to craft a compelling, enchanting story is really the excitement of the internet. The internet gave us the ability for the audience and then the social media and the different content creation tools give us that chance to make our voice heard. Uh, again, five years ago, I would not have had the capability to speak to you via video. That likely would have been an expensive enterprise-only system. Now it's done, arguably on an overpriced, but it's done on a laptop. It's done on a consumer product. Uh, the microphone, the speakers, all the rest, that is now accessible to business people in ways that it never was previously. Which basically means that as technology progresses and as the digital marketplace changes and evolves, people have more and more capabilities and power to really present their message in the best possible way. And in the worst possible way. Yes. <laughs> uh, I have to put in the caveat there that I have a lot of peers, otherwise seemingly intelligent people, whose goal in life is to automate everything. Uh, it's as if we've forgotten how much work marketing used to be. They want to automate their social media. They set up a little tool that looks for keywords and it automatically posts things out you know, at random times during the day. That's not human engagement. And that's certainly not emotional engagement when you have a robot or an automated platform try to do the connection. I am convinced that the technology is an enabler that allows you to do what we used to do, you know, standing in front of a cart and selling apples, that you were engaging with people. Now we can do is just do it at scale and we can do it more cost effectively. And we actually have the analytics. We can tell what's working in real time. I can remember when I first started with AT&T, you know, 500 years ago, we did advertising. And we would send, it was, first of all, it took a lot of time to do, huge amount, months and months for a campaign. We would send it out there, you know, big, big bucks to get it out. And it would be months and months and months to get the results. And the results, because there was always so much going on, was it effective? Was it not effective? Even on a good day, it felt like we were guessing. 
where now I can have an idea over the morning coffee, click, 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 send it out. I know immediately if that is connected with people. I can see who that has connected with. And because of the technology, has that converted? Has that resulted in whether it's a lead or an actual sale, depending on the type of product or service you're selling? That's pretty powerful stuff for a marketer because uh, assuming you have a little bit of visualization capability, a little bit of writing capability, I no longer need to rely upon the agency to do 100% of the marketing. An incredible amount of it, I can now do all myself and in real time at zero cost, other than the time it takes to do it. That's pretty powerful. It is. And a key thing that you mentioned was the human part of it, because at the end of the day, whether you are a guy selling apples on the street or you mm -hmm. are the CEO of the largest company on earth, you share one thing in common, that you're both human and a human being wants to connect with another human being. And that's what's important to keep in mind. It's like you said, with the automation, the automation is an enabler. I can take my authentic content and mm -hmm. engage with my audience. But if I just treat it like an automaton and just pull content from all over the place, it's not going to get the same results. I'm not saying brute force produces no results. I get so many, I consider them spam emails, people who have sold my name, and with no targeting, they send out to 10,000, 100,000, million people. They get some response. I would maintain you're never going to get the same quality of response than if you target. If you take that, um, recruiters, good example, they're trying to fill a position. Rather than actually look at my LinkedIn profile, which very clearly says, I have had people recruit me to be a doctor, an actual person who was given a knife to cut people open on a table. Now, I know you've looked at my LinkedIn profile. Uh, I have nothing in there about my medical skills. I didn't go to medical school. That's maybe the, the first thing. Uh, to me, that is bad marketing because it, it's not just ineffective. It makes me really question the individual. It makes me question the firm the business they are associated with to the point of, okay, block, report, and tell everyone, don't go near this person. They are very, very scary, uh, that they're just looking for numbers where it's very easy on LinkedIn to look up doctors in a certain geography uh, who may be open to talking to someone about a position. That's not a lot of effort. Uh, so if anything, I have a concern that some of my very distinguished peers are looking for shortcuts and in doing so, they're often doing more harm to themselves and the brands they represent than good. And there's no reason for that. There's no excuse for that. That is a very good point about people wanting to take shortcuts. While it's important to leverage every shortcut available, at the same time, you have to be prepared to put in the work that it takes in order to achieve the results that you want. And the irony is the work has never been less. Yes. It has never been faster. It has never been easier. People are still looking for shortcuts. And I, I hear the term growth hacking, which just sends a chill up my spine. No, it's called marketing. It's called actually engaging because the process is the same. Someone has to know you, like you, trust you in order to do business with you. And yes, there are differences if I'm selling a pack of chewing gum or I'm selling a nuclear reactor, you know, different levels of engagement, you know, and consideration in that purchasing decision. But the process is pretty much the same. That if I can trust you, I'm open to having that discussion as to how whatever it is you are selling can help me to meet my objectives. But you don't have that trust if there's no relationship chances are uh, it's not going to be a great sale, even if it is consumed, if it takes place. And, and you know, I once heard this great theory from someone that this is actually backed by science. Mm -hmm. So the brain is composed of three parts. There is the amygdala, which is also known as the reptilian brain. So on the depending on what you believe about evolution on the evolutionary scale, it's the most ancient part of the brain. 
And that brain is responsible for instinct. So I once heard a funny example from a friend of mine. So let's say you're driving in your car on the highway. Let's take the Autobahn, right? And you've got a sandwich in one hand and a soda in the other hand. You're sort of driving, you know, with your elbows. <laughs> Which would and never happen on the Autobahn, but it happens here locally in Florida on a daily yeah. basis. Yeah. And you're, and you're on a phone conversation. Hmm. Suddenly, the guy next to you cuts you off and slams on his brakes. You don't have time to think, right? What am I going to throw out first? Am I going to throw off? I'm going to throw my sandwich down. Am I going to throw off my soda? No, your foot slams on the brake so fast. Your soda spills all over your lap. Your sandwich ends up all over the car and you are safe. Okay. So its job is to protect you. And in fact, if you look at medical diagrams, the amygdala actually short circuits or shortcuts the cognitive part of the brain because you're not supposed to be thinking. There's no time to think. So the first level of engaging with people, you got to go through that gatekeeper and get people to trust you. So if they, if they, if they don't trust you, you're not getting to level two, which is the limbic system, the emotional part of the brain. So the emotional part of the brain is the part of the brain where people feel things, where people feel connected, they feel good. So back to the apple vendor, right? You want, you arrange those apples in such a nice way so that people will feel like, wow, these apples make me feel good. I want to have some. But if they don't trust you, they're not going to see that. So if you go blasting out stuff all over social media and people don't know who on earth you are, they don't trust mm -hmm. you. It doesn't matter how great your content is. Finally, you have the neocortex, which is the most evolved part of the brain, which is the cognitive part of the brain, you know, our intelligence, our logic, the features, benefits, right? So when you have a, a client that loves you and trusts you and is, is madly in love with everything you represent, now you can talk about the specifics of how this product or this service or whatever you have to offer will, will add value to their lives. And that's why you can't shortcut the system. And it's so funny in that we can do it. I'll give the example. Uh, I'm looking to buy a product, uh, a technical product, a new piece of machinery. So I follow that company on Twitter. It doesn't matter what social network, but I follow them on Twitter. I know nothing about them. Well, I follow them, I read their thought leadership pieces, I read what they have to say, I start to build trust. I start to understand their product line. I get this feeling, even though I've not had any actual communication with them, I start to feel, oh, okay, they understand people like me, that they have solutions that solve the problems I'm most interested in. So through that content marketing, through that period, which could go on for a week, it could go on for a year, I am now warmed up and now I'm a great customer. So when I reach out to them, thanks to the marketing they have done, we have a much richer discussion. I've also learned, uh, this was a big under, uh, learning when the real estate industry, I was working with them at the time, really went into the internet marketing, really went into social media. They did not, we as the industry did not have as clear an understanding of how far in advance people start looking for their next home. That the industry was wired to say when you walk into the real estate office and engage, that's when the sale starts. Turns out the sale can start as much as a year or 18 months in advance when people just start looking around. It almost in a form of infotainment. It's like, oh, let me look at the pretty houses on the fancy Sotheby's website. Let me, let me see, you know, look at the dream kitchens. That's when it starts. So if you can start aligning people to your business, your brand, and its people early on in that shopping process, it becomes much easier when they actually do walk into the office and it's like, okay, now let's have a real conversation. That makes a lot of sense. That's why you need to build that trust way in advance and not just blast stuff out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no good comes from spamming people. It really doesn't. You know, I would actually 
argue that point, and I may actually publish a book on that, how to turn spam to gold. I have a lot of fun with spam, but it's- As the receiver though. As, yes, as the receiver. Turning it on its head, yes. Yes, my policy with regards to spam is that anything that comes into me is fair game, so. I agree with that. <laughs> Anyone who contacts you is their own way of saying they need what you're selling. Yes. Rather than you need what they're selling. I am all for that, yes. So anyways, Ken, this, this was an awesome conversation. Let's, let's just talk a little bit about your social solution show. So sure. tell us a little bit about what the show's focus is and what does it talk about? Carol and I started the show roughly five or six years ago. We've been doing it for quite some time, weekly show. And the focus is really how can we help people fully leverage these new technologies as they come out? Uh, it started more with social media. How do I take advantage of LinkedIn? How do I network? How do I connect? How do I close a sale on LinkedIn and the other social networks? But now it's really more, what are the enabling technologies? Uh, I think of it when you were a little kid, some relative, the favorite aunt, the favorite uncle gave you that box of Crayola crayons, the 64 crayon box, your world changed. You know, before then there was blue, there was red, there was green. Now you had burnt umber. You had all of these colors. So as a kid, I remember vividly for my birthday getting that enhanced box of crayons, the, the joy, the magic of discovering all these new things I could color. Marketing used to be the box of 64 crayons. Now it's the warehouse tub of hundreds of crayons. And the problem is, just as we're getting comfortable, just as we're feeling semi-competent, we wake up every morning and someone has dumped a new tub of crayons on us. It's overwhelm. Beyond overwhelm, because we, many of us feel like we're still not 100% with the tools we're using today, this day of the week, but I wake up tomorrow morning and there's changes to my existing tools, updates, whether I want them or not, they're forced on me. There are new tools that I need to understand, uh, completely new forms of media. Uh, none of us currently doing marketing learned in, quote, business school, how to do a business GIF. That was just not something that existed back yeah. then. So it's that ability to feel comfortable that we are resilient enough, that we are energized enough by change. That is the mission statement of what we do every week, to help people understand what's going on and being very honest, you know, giving our own personal and professional opinions, what is effective, what isn't. For example, on this week's show, we discussed LinkedIn now has automated responses so that when I message you on LinkedIn, you're busy, you're lazy, whatever, you're in the supermarket checkout line, you have three responses. And of course, a lot of you say, oh great, I no longer have to think, I can just pick one of the pre-done, thanks to artificial intelligence and machine learning, that can be a little creepy at times. Oh, I don't have to worry about that, I'll just use the pre-done responses. And Carol and I were both exceedingly passionate that why would you want to be like everyone else? If everyone else is pushing the pre-written responses, you want to stand out. So this is an example where smart technology actually makes you the dumbest marketer. That you're better off writing a message, proving you are a human and all the machine learning in the world, it's never going to be the same as what you were thinking and how you can help to meet a customer's needs. So that's an example of a bad shortcut that LinkedIn wants you to message people. Great, all for that, they're a for-profit business, but the way in which they're doing it actually hurts the ability of marketers to connect with people. So that's one example of what we discussed on this week's show. Wow, that is very, very powerful. And, you know, it's interesting. I noticed that it just started popping up on LinkedIn and mm. I haven't used it yet. <laughs> well, there's always the temptation. You're busy, you're on a call, you're, you're not sitting down in your office focused on something. Uh, I would also suggest the, the parallel to that on LinkedIn, when you're inviting someone to connect, 
you don't have to send a message. You don't have to write a note. You can say, oh yeah, just connect, just send it. And they'll get a little pre-written, you know, Avraham wants to add you to his network. <laughs> okay, how compelling is that? If we're talking business context, not people you already have a relationship in real life, how much more powerful would it be instead of, you know, Avraham wants to connect with you, that you write, I just read your post on X. I really liked what you said about this. I would love to connect with you on LinkedIn. Something that's more warm, more personal, and more authentic. No one is going to refuse that. People are going to say, Avraham is a real person. He actually took the time to know who I am and what I care about, what I'm writing about. Of course, I'm going to connect with him on LinkedIn. Where if I get that automated response, first thing, <laughs> this lazy SOB, he can't even be bothered to write his own note. People know it's a mechanical response. If you're not investing in the relationship, that five seconds, 10 to 15, if you have to check your typing, if you're not willing to invest those 15 seconds at the start of a new relationship, yeah. how much are you going to invest in that relationship years down the road? So again, I, I am amazed by my distinguished peers why smart people sometimes do really dumb and potentially hurtful things just because technology allows you to do something, enables you to do one of these things doesn't mean it's the best business decision. Forget marketing, that it's the best business decision to help you to achieve your objectives. That is fantastic. Ken, I really appreciated you spending all this time. Uh, by the way, just before we let you go, how do people connect with you? Easy. I'm on Twitter, at sign Ken Heron. That's K-E-N-H-E-R-R-O-N. -E and connect with me. Awesome. And hopefully when they connect with you, they'll send you an authentic note. <laughs> <laughs> I know they will. <laughs> That's a prerequisite. Yes. Uh, yes. Great. And I'll, I'll put that in the show notes so people can click on that and I'll put the link to your social solution show as well so they can tune in and listen to you every week. So Ken, do you have any parting words of wisdom for the audience? It's to not be afraid to try new things. It used to be not that long ago, we would spend a week or two weeks a year, we would be sent to training. We would go off and we would train, we would learn something and we would come back and we put it into practice as marketing professionals. Now the training is ongoing. So what I myself have to be very careful of that I don't get so mired in the day to day that I leave that 5%, 10% of time to keep up with this stuff because in a very, very short time frame, I could become obsolete. You know, I think I'm fairly competent today, but if I was to go dark and not pay attention to what's happening with marketing technologies over the next 30 days, I can guarantee I would be less effective because the world is now changing at a pace that it's to allow ourselves to take, maybe it's an hour a week, just to catch up, to read what's going on, especially on the tools and platforms that are critical to our business. For example, if you have a small business selling dried flowers from your home and Facebook is your everything, that's how you get most of your customers, it is critical for you to keep up on the Facebook blog, on the top Facebook analysts to understand, okay, as Facebook continues to evolve and continues to change, how do I keep up? So even if I was really great on it two years ago, the Facebook today is very different than it was two years ago. So it's to, the simplest way I can say it is you never sharpen a pencil once and expect it to stay sharp forever. So are you taking the time on a daily basis to sharpen your pencil for the technologies that you use and are important to your business? That is a great analogy and that image will just stay in my head of that the sharpened pencil and that is great advice for all of us. And you know, for there, there's so much hype out there about people being afraid of their jobs being taken over by robots. Well, mm -hmm. if you make sure that you're that you are um, not replaceable, well, then you have nothing to worry about. And I would add to that: make sure you play nicely with the robots. <laughs> yeah. uh, my friend Christine at IBM, whose life is understanding, you know, our new robot overlords. Uh, she's very fond of saying that 
it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. The people who will survive are the people who can leverage robots, who can exploit the new robot overlords, you know, whatever your, your view on whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, it's happening. Your ability to use these automated technologies and have them work for you instead of you working for them, that's going to define your personal and professional success likely well into the next decade. Beautiful. Ken, thank you so much for your time today, for sharing your wisdom. I really appreciated having you. Thank you. I enjoy the opportunity always. Um,